title of my sermon this morning is The Importance of Church. The Importance of Church. So I want to preach this sermon this morning because I want to encourage you guys and make you understand why it's so important that you are in church. And if you want to be a successful Christian, you want to have success in your Christian life, being in a local church like this is so important for you to be rooted and grounded in a body like this. And it is a crucial part of your growing as a Christian if you want to be fruitful. So the importance of church. Now, what is a church? When you hear the word church, what do you think of? You know, most people, when they hear the word church, they think of a building. You know, maybe you're driving down and you say, hey, look at that Catholic church or see that Anglican church or that Baptist church. And people use that word referring to a building. But that's not what a church is. You know, that's why this hall, when we met here, this hall didn't suddenly become a church. No, the reason why this is a church building is because a church meets here. So church is not a building. The church is the people. We are the church. This group of people here that are gathered here today on Sunday morning, this is the church. So a church is any congregation, but obviously a church of Jesus Christ is a church that is meeting in the name of Jesus Christ, which is what we are doing here today. And we can see here in the Bible that the Bible actually defines the word church by quoting an Old Testament psalm. We see here in Psalm 22, 22, the Bible says, I will declare thy name unto my brethren in the midst of the congregation will i praise thee so you see here in psalm 22 22 it uses the word congregation then in hebrews 2 when you go to hebrews 2 and you see this old testament psalm quoted look at how it's quoted saying i will declare thy name unto my brethren look at this in the midst of the church will i sing praise unto thee so you see how a church is not a building the church is the people. So when we're building up the house of God, some churches take that literally and they think, well, I've got to go around the world and erect buildings all over the place, you know, because we're planting churches. No, when you plant churches around the world, you are gathering together a body of believers like this. Like we planted this church in Punchbowl and now we're in Liverpool. We're planting this church here because it's a group of believers. It's not just a building. Now, in the Bible, this word church is used to refer not only to the people, right? So we are the church, but the word church also refers to the general assembly. So not only are you the church, you are in church right now as we assemble here together as one body. And we see the Bible using it in these two ways. In 1 Corinthians 14, you see Paul, and it's both in uh, 1 Corinthians 14. I've got two examples. But he says here, yet in the church I had rather speak five words with my understanding that by my voice I might teach others also than 10,000 words in an unknown tongue. So it's important that you understand that the Bible uses this word differently because some people get this idea, well, hey, well, I don't have to gather here to be in church. I am the church. So if I just stay at home on Sunday mornings, I'm, I am the church. I'm in church. Uh, yes, you are the church because you gather with the church. But if you're not part of this gathering, you're not in church. I mean, Paul's not saying here that I don't want to speak five words, you know, with my understanding when he's at home by himself. No, he's talking about in the church when he's addressing the congregation like I am today. But we also see that it does refer to the people that gather as well. Because it says here, if therefore the whole church be come together into one place. So see, not only is it used to describe the general assembly, which is what we're sitting in right now, but it also describes the people right in that general assembly so we are in church but we also are a church and you are a member of the church because you are in this church that's how it works so people wonder like, how do i become a member of a local church is there a dotted line i need to sign is there something i need to commit to no if you're here then you're part of the church if you're not here then you're not part of the church when it gathers there so this is how you be part of a local church. You actually gather together with a body of believers. It's not people that follow online. You know, there's a lot of people that follow the sermons online, watch the sermons online. They're not part of this church. They're just observing what our church does. Right? Now you are commanded to be in church. This is why we read Hebrews 10 this morning. So church is not optional. Yes, church is not required to be saved. No works are required to be saved. 
Somebody can believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, never go to church, never live a good life. They can die and they will be in heaven. That's what salvation is. That's how salvation by grace works. Now that's salvation. Then you have the Christian life. The Christian life is works. Right? The Christian life is commandments that we are striving to keep. See, we don't believe in turning from sins and keeping good works to be saved. But do we believe in turning from sins and keeping the commandments to live a righteous and godly life as a believer? Yes, we do. And this is why church is not an option. See, when people do not come to church, see, when you do not prioritize church and you go somewhere else on a Sunday, you are actually in sin because you are forsaking this assembly. This assembly is a requirement of God's people to come together. And it's not just about building a big group. And this is what I want you to understand today. Coming to church is not just to say, oh, look how many people we have. It's because it's beneficial for you. It's beneficial for you to be part of this body, to hear the preaching every week so that you grow in your Christian life. And Christians try and kid themselves and they say, well, I don't need to be part of a church to read my Bible, to pray and to grow. Let's see how long you last when you're out of church and see how much you grow. Because the people that are out of church, they're the people that start to backslide. Because there's so many factors in church that are there to keep you accountable, to teach you the Word of God, so that there are people that you actually have to face. All this is part of it. So sometimes people will say things like, oh, you know, when I go to church and you know, I, I don't feel calm, people are always watching me. That's part, this is part of church. That's one thing that's good about church is that accountability. Yeah, if you're backslidden, you don't want to be held accountable. But that's why you have to be at church. If you're in church, it's going to make you accountable. It's going to strive for you to, yeah, there is a sort of expectation amongst the people that they have to live a certain way to be righteous, to, to try and live godly. That's part of it. So it's not that church is just anything goes. Yeah, it's, we're here to keep each other accountable, try and grow. The Bible says here, let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promise. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. To consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. Now sometimes people hear preaching, like maybe the way I preach. And they say, like, why is Victor on our case all the time? Right? Because this is what the purpose of church is. Right? So how, how your heart is will depend on how you respond to preaching. How you respond to encouragement. When somebody says, hey man, let's go soul winning. Hey, where were you at church? Is your heart, oh man, these guys just keep nagging me. See, that doesn't reveal the person. That reveals the, your heart. See, because if your heart is not right with God, you don't want to hear encouragement from God's people. You don't want to be at church. You don't want to be told what the right thing to do is. But if your heart is right with God, you're going to thank God that you have people in your life that are encouraging you to do right. To, to, to use your, like we learned about last week, to use your life to do something of value, of eternal value. And we talked about the purpose of our life. And let us consider one another. So you have to know each other, to consider one another, to think about each other. If you're never at church, you don't know anybody, you're, not, you're probably not considering them. To provoke and to love and to good works. Verse 25, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is. See, so there is the manner of some who are not right with God that are forsaking the assembly of God. Now, they don't, they don't necessarily have to be in this church. You know, we're not a cult where this is the only church that you can learn the truth, the only church you can be a part. If you're not part of this church, you don't agree with us, you're not saved. You know, no, we're not a cult. I mean, it's, you can be at any church where there's a Bible-believing, preaching church. I'm not saying every church is the same, I'm just saying, hey, it doesn't mean that if you're not at this church, you're in sin. No, you can be at any church, but you have to be part of a local church. It's a commandment. But exhorting one another. You see how church is about one another, considering one another, provoking unto love and good works, exhorting one another. And look at this. And so much the more as you see the day approaching. Now, at our church, we only meet here once a week on every Sunday. You know, and I, I personally think that that's a reasonable amount. You know, I think meeting any more, uh, you know, I think is a bit too much fellowship. But 
Some people meet three times a week. Some people only go to church, you know, every now and then. And then you have the Christians that are, you know, one month, you know, or the, or the Christians that are once every year. So people ask the question, well, how much church should you go to? Do you go once a week, once a month? Well, the Bible doesn't prescribe how many times you need to go to church. But what we learn from this passage is you should be going to church as much as you can. Right? You don't need less church in your life. You need more church in your life. Right? So we need to go to church as many times as we can. In this church, we meet once a week. So the believers here, you know, if you want to be a faithful servant of God, a faithful member of this church, you will be here every week. Um, and that would be obeying God's commandment. Now, when we think about church, what should church be? When we go to 1 Timothy 3, we learn here in verse 14, These things write I unto thee, hoping to come unto thee shortly. But if I tarry long, what is uh, Paul saying here? If I take a long time, you know, you're waiting for me, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. So I believe we see four things here that a church ought to be. In verse 15, he says, If I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself. So one thing church ought to be, and you guys need to internalize this yourself, church ought to be a place of godliness. You know, you don't want to come to church and have the same environment that you're trying to escape from in the world. So we don't want the church to be full of covetousness, sin, worldliness, poor speech, poor behavior. You want to come to church and Jesus is the focus. Serving Jesus is the focus. You know, come here, people act godly. They speak godly. They dress godly. That's what we want to strive for as a local church, not just for you, but for our children. You know, when you think about the way you dress, the way you act, the way you speak, the way you behave, you need to think, hey, your behavior may rub off onto some of these little ones here. And that's why it's so important that as a church, we, we create a godly atmosphere. We want the church to be a refuge from the world. We don't want people to come here in our church and there's just, just as much worldliness in our church as there is in the world. So it ought to be a godly environment. Number two is how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God. Church ought to be a family. Now, even in your family, hey, there's, there's, you know, I'm sure there are family members that you don't like. There are family members that you like, but you've got to get along. You've got to get along as a family. You need to love one another, appreciate one another, spend time with one another, treat each other as family. You know, the Bible says to treat older men as fathers, older, older women as mothers, the younger women with sis as sisters, with all purity. Right? So it's the same with the young guys in this church. The way you talk, the way you act towards young women, you need to treat them with respect and with dignity and honor. Not just to, you know, some guys, they just go to churches, they're playing and fooling around with all the girls. This is unacceptable. Right? You need to treat them as you, you, that they were your daughter or your sister. Which is the church of the living God. Here we go, the pillar and ground of the truth. The so two things here is, what's a pillar? A pillar, if you think about a pillar in a building, it holds things up, doesn't it? It's, it keeps things up and stops them from falling down. Now, the church ought to be a pillar of truth. That's why when you come to church, you can hear the truth. The truth ought to be preached from God's Word. So that's why you'll come here. You may learn about uncomfortable topics like fornication, homosexuality being a sin, you know, abortion being murder. You'll come to church, you'll hear these things because the church ought to be a pillar of truth and uphold these truths and make sure that the people of God hear these truths. And lastly, the church ought to be a ground of truth. And this is where I want to focus my sermon on today, that the church not only upholds the truth, but it's a, it's a ground of truth as well. Somewhere where you can be planted and grow as, you know, using the analogy, a tree of God in God's garden. So we're going to look at the analogy today of a garden and how a church is likened to a garden. 
and the different things that make a garden successful. And when you apply these in your spiritual life, how these things can be applied spiritually so you understand why being planted in a local church is so important. Now the Bible tells us that the church is the pillar and ground of the truth. So number one, the soil in a garden, that's what the church is. It's somewhere where you can come and you can get planted into. Now think about this. Can a seed sprout without being in soil? It can, right? You know, I know Lewis. Lewis is telling me about uh, growing his wheatgrass. You know, he grows his wheatgrass. He doesn't plant them in soil. He just puts them in containers. Just puts water there, and then they, they sprout, and then they and the, and, the, and the roots. You know, if you've ever maybe uh, sprouted something on your kitchen sill, you know, you might put the end of a I don't know, like a lettuce in there, and it starts sprouting. On what Elizabeth puts it. She puts it on the window. Uh, the, the spring onions. Yeah, you use your spring onions, and you put them on the thing, and then they sprout, and then you can plant them. So if you think about it. A seed can sprout without soil. And if you think about salvation, it's like somebody can be saved without church. They can be saved, but can a, can a tree, can, can, a, can a seed grow into a tree if it's not planted in the ground? You know, is that seed going to root itself down and grow into a strong tree where it can provide shade to others and be fruitful and multiply? No. And that's why people are kidding themselves if they're out of church and they think they're going to be fruitful for God. They need to be part of a local body of believers. So if you want to grow into a strong tree, you need to be planted in the ground. And you know, honestly, it's better to be in a church where you don't agree 100% than to not be in church at all. Right? So you need to be in church. I mean, ideally, you find a church where you do agree 100%. If there is one, if not, you find the best that you can go to. You get planted in that local church. You serve the body to the best of your ability. Because if you don't, you will not grow at all. You'll just be a, uh, what do they call us? A sprout or what do they call the fledgling plants that will not grow into something big and strong spiritually. The Bible says, if you remember in verse 15, the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. So the church is like soil that you need to be planted in. What else does a tree need to be successful? You know, a plant. It needs light, doesn't it? It needs light to be successful. It needs sunlight. Now the Bible tells us here in Psalm 119, this is why you hear the word preached in church. It's important for you to be under the preaching. It says, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. So just like a plant requires the sunlight to grow, you as a Christian, you need light in order to grow as a Christian. And when you think about spiritual light, what does light do? Well, in this passage, it guides you. So the Word of God is light that guides you. It guides you to the right path and it guides you away from the wrong path, away from sin and doing what's right. And this is part of why church is important. You learn what is right, you learn what is wrong, you know, hopefully you come to church, you see good examples that you can follow to help guide your life. Now what's interesting about this passage is the Bible says, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. So what I find interesting about that is, you know, sometimes the word of God, it's not going to tell you the future. Like 10, it's not going to tell you where you're going to be in 10 years time, 20 years time, 30 years time. But what it does give you is it gives you enough light so you know the next step to take. And if you just keep walking, you, you, it's a light to your feet, a lamp to your feet, a light to your path, so you know just to keep walking. You may not know what the future holds, but if you keep walking faithfully, serving the Lord, obeying the commandments that you know, the Bible says that the Lord is going to direct your steps. So I sort of see it this way. You know, we, we need to step on the gas, you know, or step on the accelerator. But God's going to drive the ship, right? He's going to direct the car. And if you just keep walking, obeying what you know, what you see in the Bible, it'll give you enough light to know what to do for your next step. But you may not know where you end up in five or ten years. You know, I mean, if you'd ask me about my life, you know, you know do, do I, did I see my life turning out the way I did when I first became a Christian, when I was younger? You know, I didn't know that I was going to be, you know, in Sydney. You know, I thought I'd be living in Perth my whole life. 
You know, I didn't think it, 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 I'd find myself in Mexico and Phoenix and, oh man, life was crazy back then. So I'm glad it's settled down a bit and, uh, you know, who knows what the future holds. We just got to be faithful, keep walking in the light that we have just at our feet. What else do we need to be successful? You need water for a plant to grow. Water. Now in the Bible, the Word of God is also likened unto water. You know, Jesus is the living water, right? The, the living water that flows out of us. The Spirit also is likened to water. It says here that He might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the Word. So what's another reason why church is important? Because when you get here, a plant needs water. You, as a Christian, need water to be washed. Washed from what? To be washed from your daily sins. Not salvation. Not the salvation where you're washed by the blood of Jesus Christ and the punishment of sin is gone. It's the daily walk of sins. Like Jesus said to Peter. Peter said to him, you know, when, to wash me, it is not my hands, only, not my feet only, but also my head and my hands. And Jesus said, no, no, no. If you're, if you're clean, you don't need to be fully washed. You just need to wash your feet. Because why? What happens in your Christian life? You live your Christian life you start to backslide a bit, you know, you get back into your old ways, you get back into sin, and you need to come to church to be washed by the Word, to be reminded as well that God still loves you. You know, yeah, maybe you failed God, but God still loves you with an everlasting love. Jesus Christ said, I will never leave thee, nor forsake thee. You know, thank God for those words, that we come short every day, but God still loves us, and that experience, that love that you experience from God ought to drive you to continue to serve God. So this is another reason why church is important. Because you come, you hear the word. It helps to clean, helps you to get rid of that sin. You're reminded, hey, there's more to life than just pleasure and riches and living for yourself. We need to cut the sin out of our life. We need to cut the worldliness out. You know, we need to cut the, the drunkenness, the fornication, the drugs, so that we can move on to do things for the Lord Jesus Christ. We need to cut out the hate, the malice. We need to cut out the covetousness, the greed, the materialism. These are things that we need to cut out of our lives because these are vain things that are holding you back from doing great things for the Lord. When you come to church, you're reminded of those things. What else does a plant need? Well, a plant needs, to, in order for a plant or a tree to thrive, it needs nutrients. You know, and we're still on the Word of God because not only is the Word of God light, to your path. The Word of God is water that's going to wash you clean of the daily sins that you commit. But also nutrients. It's going to feed you with spiritual food. And just like a plant needs a constant stream of nutrients. You, know, you can't just give a plant you, know, you can't just dump a bunch of stuff on a plant and then just leave it. You know, you constantly have to take care of these plants, right? You have to constantly give it nutrients. Like, like the Bible says, the rain comes and it pours out that blessing. That rain has to come and keep feeding those plants, these nutrients that come with the rain so that the plant can continue to grow. The Bible says here in Luke 4, when Jesus was tempted, and the devil said unto him, If thou be the Son of God, command this stone that it be made bread. And Jesus answered him, saying, It is written that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. Now, here's an interesting passage in Isaiah 28, and I want to apply it to church here. It says in Isaiah 28, Whom shall he teach knowledge, and whom shall he make to understand doctrine? Them that are weaned from the milk and drawn from the breast. For precept must be upon precept, Precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little and there a little. So this is how you learn doctrine. The way you learn doctrine when you come to church, how it's beneficial is you just learn a little bit every time you come here. See, it's not going to be this one sermon that's just going to change your life. It's just like in your physical life. It's not going to be one meal that just went, you went from weak to strong. No, it's eating consistently, day after day, week after week, as you get a little, and then you realize, wow, we're growing, I'm getting stronger, you know, these nutrients are starting to benefit me. 
It's the same with uh, nutritional supplements. You know, people say like, well, I took some nutritional supplements. Yeah, but that's not how nutritional supplements work. It's not like just a kill shot, a silver bullet to make you better. No, it's the consistent giving your body those nutrients to keep it strong. And it's the same in church. It's not going to be just one church service that changes your life. But you know what? If you're in church week after week after week after week, listening to the preaching, you'll catch a little bit every Sunday. You know, I mean, hopefully, hopefully you're learning something today. If you learn something today, imagine if you hear sermon after sermon after sermon every week. That's how you're going to grow. And that's the sort of nutrients that a plant needs to be successful for the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, when we think about roots, for a plant to grow into a successful tree, a strong tree, it needs to be rooted into that ground. Now, when I think of roots in a local church, I liken it to the relationships that are in this church. And if you do not strive to have good relationships in this church, and you make friends in this church, you know, a lot of people, they come to church because of friends. I'm sure everybody here, you know, you, maybe you came to this church because a friend invited you. A friend invited you to come and it's because of those relationships, because of those roots that you're here. And you know what keeps people healthy in the body of Christ and stay in a church is good relationships as well. You know, unfortunately, people get out of church just because they have personal problems. That's a terrible reason, reason to leave a church. But people do. It's a reality of life where people don't get along with somebody or somebody did something wrong against them and then they get out of church. But you know what? If they had strong roots with other people in the church, that would keep them there and they could work through those conflicts. So the relationships in your church are so important because this is how we grow. We edify one another. Edification is not only just one way. I kind of think of myself as like the mouth of this body, right? The head is Jesus Christ, you know, but I'm the preacher here, so I'm like the mouth of this church. I speak on behalf of this church. But the body is not just going to get strengthened only from the mouth. So we read here in Ephesians 4 when it's talking about the body, it says, from whom the whole body, that's all of us, because the church is likened to a body, and a body has different body parts, Every body part has a, has a necessity there. Right? Every body part brings it together to make a body. From whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted. So you see how there's a closeness there in the body. Right? It's not like when you have a human body, all the parts are separated. No, we're all together. They're all joined together. There's, there's a spirit or a lifeline like the blood that flows through that body, keeping it alive joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplier. You have a part to play in this church, to edify this church, to build this church up. Don't downplay your role. Don't think, you know, I'm not important to this church. It doesn't matter what I do. No, it matters what you do. It matters how you live your life. It matters how you serve in this church. Your example in this church will have an effect on the body. Have you ever stubbed your toe before? Doesn't that, doesn't that kill? <laughs> you stub your toe. But most people think, you know, it's just your pinky toe. You don't really think about it that much. It's not until you lose your pinky toe that you realize it's so hard to walk on that foot. You stub your pinky toe and man, the whole body is just like, oh, you know, you stub it. So you can stub it at night and just like, oh man, it just hurts so much. You need to think about that when you think about your effect on the local church. You, know, you, that you can have that effect on the local church because we are a body here. You are not an island. If you're in sin, if you're not living right, it will have an effect on the whole body. And that's why it's for all of us. You know, it's not just me to make sure I'm living right with God. And you say, hey, Victor's the bishop. Yeah, it's expected of him. No, it's expected of all of us to live right for the sake of everybody else and for the sake of the children. And first and foremost, for the sake of Jesus Christ. 
that which every joint supplies, according to the effectual working, look at this, of the measure of every part, maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. Now, I've got a couple more. Another thing, you know, and th this is the unpleasant one. This is the one that people don't like. But it's a necessity in your Christian life. Just like dung, or you know, maybe you can think of it as fertilizer, is a, is a necessity to have a successful tree. You need some dung in your life as well, right? To be a successful Christian. Now, when you think about dung in the body of Christ, what do you think of? I think of the conflicts. You know, because inevitably, when you are close with people and you're working together here, you know each other really well. We're like a family, just like sometimes you'll butt heads with family members, you're going to butt heads with spiritual family members. See, and that's not the time to quit church. That's the time, that's an opportunity to grow. That's an opportunity to humble yourself, try and make it right, rebuild that relationship, try and move forward. And when you're part of a church, that's part of what you experience. You know, people are quitting church just because they don't get along with everybody. That's the point of church. The point of church is that you come here so that you can strive to try and get along with everybody. It gives you the opportunity to try and love your brother and sister in Christ. Try and be selfless. You try and help somebody in need. It, and, and if you have conflict, that's something that you can grow in as well when you are part of a local body here. Look what the Bible says here in Matthew 18. Moreover, if thy brother tre uh, shall trespass against thee, go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. If he shall hear thee, thou hast gained thy brother. See, so conflict is not always a bad thing. Conflict is an opportunity to strengthen a relationship. And if you see conflict that way, you won't run from conflict. You will face conflict head on and think, hey, this is an opportunity for me to strengthen this relationship. This is especially applicable in your married life. In your married life, if, you, if you're a guy that's just constantly avoiding conflict, you'll have a terrible marriage. You know, don't be the sort of guy where it's just like, ah, oh, you know, I just can't deal with my wife. Just like, oh, it's just, I'd rather just, just stay at work and just not go home, just not deal with it. Eventually, your marriage will just get worse and worse and worse. You need to think of conflict as a way that you can strengthen that relationship, a way that you can make amends and get back together. And the more conflict you go through as a couple, if you can overcome that conflict, then you will strengthen that relationship. And it works the same, even in churches. So not only is uh, you know, the dung in a garden is conflict, but it's just the suffering as well. You know, the suffering that you go through uh, in life, and you can come here and get comfort. And you come to church and you're comforted through that suffering. Look at what it says here in Colossians 3, talking about you know, uh, the relationships in church. Put on therefore as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering. See, we need these kind of qualities. This is, this is what church provides you. It provides you with not because we're not perfect. You know, when you come to church, you're not coming to a, to, a, to a church of perfect people. You are coming to a church full of sinners saved by grace. And when you come to a church full of sinners saved by grace, not everyone's going to be perfect. Not everyone's going to be where you are in the Christian life. We've got to show some mercy on people. People that are new in the Christian faith, we need to give them some time. right? People that you know, are struggling with things in their life, you know, we don't want to look down on other people. We just need to realize people are at different stages of their spiritual life, but we all want to be moving forward in the same direction. Meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another and forgiving one another. What's the difference between forbearing something and forgiving something? See, when you forbear something is when you put up with something. You know, maybe somebody's doing you wrong, you put up with it, you put up with it. You don't cause a fuss about it. When you forgive somebody, it's when they ask for forgiveness. They apologize and they say, I'm sorry, and you need to forgive them. If any man have a quarrel against any. So this is the perspective we should have when people wrong us. It says, hey, if you have a quarrel with somebody and they wrong you, 
if they apologize to you or, and they repent, the Bible says here, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. So where do you find it in yourself to forgive somebody that has wronged you so badly is that you remember how much you have wronged Jesus Christ and yet he died for you. you know, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Second one, second last one I want to talk about is weeds. Like I said, church is not just a not just a free for all. You know, there are certain sins that are not allowed at church, and if they are discovered, they need to be exposed and they need to be rooted out. Right? Unrepentant sin. So just like in a garden, you can't have a successful garden if it's just overrun with weeds. Those weeds need to be pulled out and gotten rid of so that those plants can thrive and grow in that ground. And there are things that will get people kicked out of a local body. I remember when I was interviewed once, the guy asked me, well, isn't, shouldn't everyone just be welcome at church? No. You didn't learn that from the Bible. Not everyone's just welcome at church. There are things that you can do that will make you not welcome at church. Why? Because remember what we talked about at the beginning. We need a godly environment at this church. We want people to grow in godliness and in righteousness and you can't have certain rampant sins in the church. They need to be gotten rid of or the person needs to get right. 1 Corinthians 5. This is the big chapter on throwing out certain people out of the church. I wrote unto you in an epistle not to company with fornicators. Now, fornication is not just sex outside of marriage. It's any sex that is illegitimate. So that includes bestiality. It includes homosexuality. It includes adultery. And it is also unmarried people sleeping together outside of marriage. So people that are in sexual sin, if it is reported commonly in the church and, and it's known and it's not repented of, they are not right, they will not be welcome here. Yet not altogether with the fornicators of this world. So what is Paul saying here? It's not that you can get away from every fornicator, right? Otherwise you'd have to leave the world. Not altogether with the fornicators of this world, or with covetous or extortioners, or with idolaters, for then must you needs go out of the world. So he's saying, hey, if you've got to get if you've got to get away from fornicators, people that are covetous, idolaters, then you need to leave the world. No, he's just talking about, hey, you need to get these sins out of church. But now I have written unto you not to keep company. If any man that is called a brother. So this is somebody that is at the church for a while. We're not talking about visitors, new believers, you know, people that are still very young in their faith. We're talking about people that are they're called a brother. They're a respected person in that church. Be a fornicator or covetous or an idolater or a railer or a drunkard or an extortioner. With such an one, no, not to eat. So let's just go through these sins quickly. We talked about fornication. Covetousness is not welcome at church. So if somebody comes to church and all they're talking about is money, materialism, talking about you know just get, you know making more money all the time and getting rich, that sort of behavior is not welcome at church. We don't want people to come to church with covetousness, just thinking about, hey, this life is just all about building riches and building wealth for how you look, you know, getting ahead in your career, and that's all that you're about, that's what's not welcome at church. We don't want that sort of environment at our church. An idolater is, is obviously uh, is, uh, obvious, right? If somebody's worshipping a, a statue, they are not welcome at church. What is a railer? A railer is somebody who's a false accuser. If somebody's a false accuser, that is not welcome at church either. So if somebody is known for railing on other people, they are not welcome at church. A drunkard, somebody who has an excess of alcohol, right, where they are no longer sober anymore, they lose control. So people that are drunkards are not allowed at church. Okay, so if people, if I find out, see, and, and, and so I don't do this to me, guys. I really hate having to confront people about sins like this. 
but if I find out about it and, and people are drinking too much and they're a drunkard, they will not be allowed at this church. So if I find out about it, you have to expect a call from me. I hate doing it. I hate, try, I hate telling people off, but that's why don't do it to me, guys. I'd rather if you just take heed to God's word and don't put me in that situation. Or an extortioner, right? Blackmail. With such an one, no, not to eat. For what have I to do to judge them also that are without? Do not ye judge them that are within? But them that are without, God judges. So you see, people that are not in church are left to God's judgment. But he says, but them that are without, God judges. Therefore put away from among yourselves that wicked person. So it's not wrong to call somebody who's an idolater or a fornicator or a covetous or an extortioner or a drunkard that that person is a wicked person and ought not to fellowship with the people of God until they repent and get right. Right? They get, they return from that sin. Then they are allowed to be back at church. Now they're not the only sins. You know, it's not an all-exhaustive list. There's a few other examples of things that will get a person kicked out of church. Now in 2 Thessalonians 3, I don't know if you know this, but if somebody is lazy, that they, they will not work, that they are an able-bodied person and they're just too lazy to go get a job and get to work and they're constantly mooching off others, that person also is not allowed at church and is not welcome at church. It says, Now we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you withdraw yourselves so you get away from this type of person. We're not talking about somebody that's genuinely poor, trying to make ends meet and is struggling. Right? We're talking about somebody who's able-bodied and is just too lazy to work. From every brother that walketh disorderly and not after the tradition which he received of us. You can see here disorderly is underlined because you'll see here that what he's talking about later when it comes to being disorderly is that you are not working, you are lazy. For yourselves know how you ought to follow us. For we behave not ourselves disorderly among you. So Paul's saying, when we came to you, we showed you a good example of not behaving disorderly, and we worked hard. Neither did we eat any man's bread for naught, but wrought with labor and travail night and day that we might not be chargeable to any of you. Now some people try and use this passage to say that Paul, you know, preachers shouldn't get paid. No, 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 it's not that... Paul did get paid. You know, you can't just ignore every other passage in the Bible. Paul got paid by the church. But he's saying here, when he went to the Thessalonians, he wanted to make it an example to them of how to work hard. So when he went here on this occasion, he said, hey, we work night and day so that we weren't chargeable to you so that we could be an example. Look at this. Not because we have not power. He's saying he has the authority to be paid by the local church for the work he does. But he's saying in this example, hey, I'm giving you an example, not because we, not, we have not power, but to make ourselves an example unto you to follow us. For even when we were with you, this we commanded you. Look at this, that any, if any would not work, neither should he eat. So you see, when we, work, when we come together as a church, we eat. And churches in, in, the old, in the New Testament, when they got together, they ate. But if somebody was able-bodied and too lazy to work, they're not going to eat with us. Right? If he won't work, neither should he eat. For we hear that there are some which walk among you disorderly. So you see how when he's talking about behaving disorderly, it's that person is lazy, working not at all, but are busybodies. Now them that are such we command and exhort by our Lord Jesus Christ that with quietness they work and eat their own bread. So it's a, it's a command here that those that are lazy ought to get to work. Now two others that will get you kicked out of church. One is unrepentant sin against a brother. Unrepentant sin against a brother. We already read verse 15 in Matthew 18. But if we go on, where it's you go between him and thee alone, and if he repents, you've gained your brother. But if he will not hear thee, then take with thee one or two more, that in the mouth of two or three witnesses every word may be established. If somebody wrongs another person and they don't ask for forgiveness, and they've been approached by the person that they've wronged, if they don't turn from that, maybe they don't agree that it's wrong. 
you, you, the, what, what then happens is you approach that person with two or three witnesses. So that there now are some people to hear the case as well and say, hey, you know, yeah, you have done wrong. You ought to apologize. And if he shall neglect to hear them, tell it unto the church. But if he neglect to hear the church, let him be unto thee as a heathen man and as a publican. So you see how here is a protocol that is given to us to make things right with other people. And you know, just to put this in a practical example, you know, when, when it comes to legal things where, you know, maybe somebody has wronged somebody financially. And when we read into 1 Corinthians 6, it talks about dare not, you know, uh, somebody having a matter against a brother, go before the unjust, right? And people will say, well, you should never take your brother to court. And I don't agree with that. I don't agree that there is never a place for legal action. But what I do believe is before it gets to legal action, this is the protocol that's to be followed. That you try and get it right with them, you try and deal with it first in church, amongst a few people, with the church, if they will not hear this. So let's say somebody, you did a job for somebody in church, and they didn't pay you, and they won't pay you, right? And you go to them, and you go with three, they still will not be willing to try and pay that. They're just, you know, they're, they're in the wrong, you've done the work. We bring it before the church. They're still not willing to hear. They say, no, I will not pay for this job for whatever reason, their heart is hard. Then they're cast out of the church. And then that's when you can take legal action because now they're treated not as a brother, they're treated as a heathen or a publican. So that's how I believe it works. So I don't think it's never take a believer to, church, uh, to, to court. I think that you have to follow this protocol. And the reason why it's there is because if you go through this step where there are people in church that are able to judge righteously between two brothers, then you won't take somebody to court unrighteously. Because that's what 1 Corinthians 6 is condemning, is that you go to the court of the unjust and you use the arm of an unrighteous, ungodly government against your brother unrighteously. But if you go through this protocol, you go through God's steps of accountability, then we can make sure the only things that reach court are only when nothing else can be done and, and it's the right thing to do. Now here's the last one. The last one is in Romans 16 and this is heresy is not allowed at church. Heresy where they're teaching you know, another Jesus, where they're teaching a false gospel. These, this doctrine is not allowed at church and people that bring this doctrine. Romans 16, Now I beseech you, brethren, Mark them which cause divisions and offences contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned and avoid them. Now, I, I've heard this used a lot in churches where it's just when you go against the bishop. You know, they say when you go against the bishop, you know, you don't agree with the bishop, then you just get cast out. No, no, this is not just contrary to the things I teach you. It's the things that we learn from God's word. You know, if I teach something wrong, or if I do something wrong, I need to be accountable to you guys too. That's why, remember, everybody, every part, this church includes me. I'm part of this body. Accountability in this church is not just one way. It's not just me keeping you guys accountable. It's you guys keeping me accountable. It's all of us keeping everyone accountable, right? Yes, I'm the preacher. I'm trying to be an example to you guys, but I'm not above reproach. And I'm not always right. You know, I can be wrong on things. So the Bible says here, hey, you know, we need to mark those. But there is a certain line that you can cross. When we talk about heresy, these are things that affect salvation, eternal life, the blood of Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ being God, Jesus Christ dying and rising again. These things affect salvation and these things are not allowed at church. Now, I'm coming to a close here, but ultimately, why do we want to be planted in the house of God and be a strong, successful tree for the kingdom of God because God wants us to be fruitful. God doesn't just want plants that are pretty. You know, I know some ladies, they, they plant gardens like that. They plant gardens, they, they just want it to look nice. And there's nothing wrong with that. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with having a garden that looks nice, having plants that look nice. <coughs> But this is not the sort of garden that God wants. God doesn't want a garden full of trees that have no fruit on them. And we see a parable here in the Bible 
where Jesus likens himself to this husbandman. In Luke 13, I'll read this parable to you. It says, He spake also this parable. A certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came and sought fruit thereon and found none. So you see how God is watching your life to see if your life is fruitful. He wants trees that are fruitful. That's the purpose. It's not just so that we can come here dressed nice, say, hey, how you doing, brother? Put on our Sunday best. And then we just go back into the world six days of the week. Now, the idea of church is that you're planted and rooted in a godly ground for the purpose that you would be fruitful for the Lord Jesus Christ. Fruitful in winning souls. Bringing people to the kingdom. Helping to build this house with more people, more souls, so we can get more people saved. So the, the husbandman comes to the vineyard. He plants this tree. He says he came and he sought fruit thereon. So he's wanting fruit from this fig tree and he found none. Then said he unto the dresser. I want you guys to hear this verse. Then said he unto the dresser of his vineyard, Behold, these three years. So God is patient. Years later, I come seeking fruit on this fig tree and find none. Look at what he says. Cut it down. Now, this is not somebody losing their salvation. Right? When we're applying to this as a believer. This is just somebody being, you know, either you can apply it to being removed from the earth, you know, or you get taken out of church. And sometimes it's not always, you know, you know, obviously your sin will lead you to get out of church, but sometimes God takes you out of church somehow. You know, I don't know how he always does it. He says, he found find none, cut it down. Look at this. Why cumbereth it the ground? Now, I don't think it's any coincidence that the Bible says that the church is the pillar and ground of the truth. And that what the Bible is teaching us here in this parable is that when a tree is planted in the church and it's not fruitful, it is actually cumbering the ground. What does it mean to cumber? When something's cumbersome, it's troublesome, isn't it? It's troubling that ground. And the Bible is saying here that when Somebody is planted in the church. Sorry, guys. Uh, Anthony, if, I don't know whose kid that is, but if, if they're crying, if, if they're crying, can, if, can we take them out and just console them and then bring them back in? You, you missed it when I mentioned it at the beginning, Anthony. I'm sorry. Just because it's a little bit distracting for everyone. Uh, when she calms down, just bring her back in. And he answering said unto them, so look at this, why cumbereth it the ground? So the point I'm trying to make here is when we are not fruitful as a Christian, we are troubling that ground. Because what does it mean to be cumbersome? To be troublesome. And this is why God doesn't want that. God doesn't want a tree in the ground that is troubling the ground. And that's why he's like, hey, I'm going to give it some time, but eventually I'm going to take it out. And he answering said unto him, Lord, look at this. This is the dresser of the vineyard saying yes. So God has patience with us. He gives us time. He says, let it alone this year also, till I shall dig about it and dung it. So God doesn't just give up on you because you're not fruitful. You know what God's going to do? He's going to bring some pain in your life. Remember we talked about dung that a plant needs? And I don't know about you, but I'd rather just be fruitful of my own accord rather than have God intervene in my life and have to dig around my life, sep cut some things around and, and, and throw some dung my way. I would rather just of my own accord try and be fruitful. God see my fruitfulness and he'll purge that branch that it'll be more fruitful. So that's why sometimes when people are in sin, God's going to send some chastisement your way. He's going to dig about the tree. He's going to dung it. And then he says, and if it bear fruit, well. And if not, then after that thou shalt cut it down. Do you see how God doesn't want a church full of fruitless Christians? He wants you to be fruitful and he's going to do something about it. And I would, like I said, I would rather of my own accord be fruitful for God rather than God's chastising hand come down on my life. Look what the Bible says in John 15. I am the true vine and my father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. 
So this is not losing your salvation if you're in Jesus Christ. Sometimes God will either take you from the earth or he'll get you out of church because he doesn't want you cumbering the ground. And every branch that beareth fruit, look at this, he purgeth it that it may bring forth more fruit. See, when you try and start growing as a Christian, you try and start being fruitful, you'll realize that God will help you to cut those sins out of your life. And the more you serve God, the more you strive and be fruitful, you'll look back at your life three years from now and you won't even recognize the person that you were when you got saved. As long as you're striving to be fruitful, you're striving to do what's right, God is going to purge you. He's going to purge the sins out of your life. He's going to change you and you will be even more fruitful. Now I'm going to end on the I'm going to end on Luke 8 here. This is the last passage I want to go through. And the reason why I want to end here is even though church can be a godly place, church can provide you with the nutrients, the water, the light, the atmosphere, the relationships, Unless your heart is right with God, that's not going to help you. You will not be fruitful unless your heart is right with God. Because nobody can force you to do right. So it's just like a garden. Like If God doesn't want that seed to grow, it's not going to grow. It doesn't matter how much you dung it, how much you take care of it. Like in the Old Testament, God just cursed the ground. It doesn't matter what they did. They could not grow anything. And it's the same in your life. If your heart is not right, like if you hear a sermon like this and you're just like, yeah, well, I don't care. I don't care what God wants. You know, I'd rather do my own thing on the weekend. If your heart's not right, it doesn't matter how godly this church is, how much preaching you hear, the relationships that are here for you to have. If you don't have the right heart, you're not going to be fruitful. Luke 8 is the parable of the sower. This is the explanation of the parable. Now the parable is this, the seed is the word of God. Those by the wayside are they that hear, then cometh the devil and taketh away the word out of their hearts, lest they should believe and be saved. So there are some people that hear the word and they don't get saved. Right? So this is the scenario where they don't believe and they don't get saved. The other three scenarios are for believers. They on the rock are they which when they hear receive the word with joy. And these having no root, which for a while believe, and in time of temptation fall away. Why? Because they don't have roots. They're not rooted in the ground. Like we talked about, hey, a seedling can sprout. Hey, I mean, who's had you know, vegetables like potatoes in, the, in their pantry? And you know, without even any water, right? They just sprout. And it's just the moisture in the air makes them sprout. See, people can sprout when they're out of church, but if you want to grow into a strong tree, you need to be rooted. These people that don't have root, then when temptation, ridicule comes your way, maybe from family or friends or colleagues, or you go through some hard times, if you're not rooted and grounded and have the right perspective, you'll fall away as well from church. And that which fell among thorns, are they which when they have heard, go forth and are choked with cares and riches and pleasures of this life and bring no fruit, fruit to perfection so that's the materialism the cares of this life and the riches the chasing the things that are vain in this life verse 15 we'll end here but that on the good ground are they which in an honest and good heart having heard the word keep it and bring forth fruit with patience so you see if you want if you are in a good ground you still need your heart right with god you need an honest and good heart that's willing to hear the word of God and not be a hearer only, but be a doer. This man shall be blessed in his deed. So even though we can provide you with all the things you need to have a successful Christian life, ultimately your heart needs to be right with God because it's going to be your heart that's just going to stop you from being fruitful even if you're in a great, godly, Bible-believing church. So it's important to be in church, but even more important that your heart is right when you come to church and be ready to hear more to hear than the song of fools. All right, let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for the reminder on how important church is. Lord, just little by little, line upon line, line upon line, precept upon precept, precept upon precept, here a little, there a little. Lord, help us not to get out of church. 
Help us to, to be part of this church. Help us not to cumber the ground. And I pray, Lord, that you'd help us to be fruitful as a believer, fruitful in this ground here. And um, help us, Lord, we are, we are, we are weak. You know, the, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. And we, sometimes we know, Lord, or many times, we know what is the right thing to do, but it's just so difficult to do it. And I just pray, Lord, in this church, we would consider one another uh, to provoke unto love and good works. Lord, that we would work through issues that we have with one another. And Lord, we would strive for greater and we would realize the important part that we play in this body of believers here. We pray all these things in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.